You know, it's a real, real privilege for me. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be a little distracted. Um, I accepted to do this, and uh, I didn't uh, put together all of the excitement I get to be involved with right now. I feel a little bit like uh, Alma's description when he talks about uh, the exquisiteness of his pain and the exquisiteness of his joy. I have the privilege of being the uh, state president who was in charge of the uh, tabernacle when it burned down. <laughs> they called me at 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, that was just such a miserable. Under my watch, we lost all that history and that richness, and, uh, and now I get to be a tour guide uh, for uh, this new temple, and it is spectacular. And I'm, so I, we're, I'm on the historical committee that's writing a, a history that's going in the uh, cornerstone, and so I'm, I just finished the chapter on the fire while I'm giving these tours. And it's, uh, it's a, such a contrast of feelings that, uh, that I can appreciate Alma's statement in a, in a different kind of way. So I'm a little distracted, but I, there's no topic that means more to me than what difference should it make to us as educators that we are Latter-day Saints? There are certain kinds of things I think the Lord has revealed to us in remarkable uh, sections of Doctrine and Covenants, for example. Section 42, section 50, 76, 88, uh, 121, 93, 76. I mean, there's, there's, there's really some profound ideas that I don't think we've ever really developed very well. Um, one of the great warnings that I think that happens in section 93 is it suggests that light and truth are taken from the children of men in two ways. One is through their disobedience, and the other is through the tradition of their, of their fathers. Well, that's an interesting problem, because we are in the business of promoting traditions, right? Some of them shouldn't be promoted. Uh, we've adopted some. Sometimes we do it out of uh, convention. Sometimes uh, it's because we won't be respected or something. We, we think that we do it that way. But the other side of it is that there's a promise that I think could yet be tapped if we had the faith to do so. And I'd like to at least explore some of that with you today. Um, I, you know, I've, I've got way too much material probably, so I'll just, I'll just share with you a, a few things. I've got to say hi to Andy first. Hi, Andy. Are you still alive out there? <laughs> Start with a big question. Moses was a curriculum writer, right? I, I, he didn't think of himself as a curriculum writer, but uh, he had a tough assignment. You're going to write the uh, first really important book that's going to go on for generations, at least that they're going to keep. We have Adam apparently had one that we kind of have lost. Hopefully we'll get that someday. But uh, it's interesting how he decided to write his curriculum. It's like, okay, what should I start with? If you read the book of Moses, it's a different kind of uh, an introduction than you get in Genesis, right? But it's a really powerful one. You think, okay, of all the things you could start to share with people, um, why pick what he picked? Uh, he talked about a particular experience he had, right? And I don't want to go into the details of that. It's really well worth exploring very carefully, though, to watch and say, well, okay, if I were going to introduce the world to the most important perspective that one could have, how could I do that? And he starts with a particular personal experience uh, that he had with the Lord. At a time when he was caught up into a high mountain. Right? The Lord talks to him. He shows him a vision of the earth that must have been absolutely profound. Um, and if you watch line by line, it's kind of like, well, let's introduce this part, this part. When you're done, you, have, you know a lot more about God than you do about man. Uh, you put it in perspective that says, but man, what you do know about man is that he's a son of God. Placed here to do something. Moses, my son, I have a work for thee. And he's not saying that to say, see, so there I'm, therefore I'm important. He's saying it really to say, you, we have work to do. And then he proceeds to tell, uh, as he received this vision that the Lord gave to him, he asked, why are these things so? And by what made us though? He talks about the, the Son of God, the Savior, as central to this whole process. And then he gives this, uh, this statement that you often quote, uh, about why he does this. It is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. 
Well, that's an interesting statement to make. And you say, well, what should that mean to educators if that's true for him? What does it mean to help the, uh, the immortality and eternal life of man? It seems to me that whatever education is supposed to do, it has something to do with that. Right? Um, I don't know if it gives us a whole lot of reasons of how, we, how we're supposed to do it, how we're supposed to go about that, and how we approach it, but it's, uh, there's an interesting side of that. Uh, this was part of, uh, there's a phrase we use in the church, the Grand Council. Um, tell me what you, what we, why we call it a council. Give me some ideas. You could call it lots of things. There was some kind of a, something was happening. Why call it a council? There were, everyone had to make a decision, I guess, when they came. Well, wasn't it already decided what you're supposed to decide? I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't even remember. <laughs> it's interesting that, say, well, it was a count that we used that phrase that they did counsel. Well, I think about the phrase, come let us reason together. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe the decision was already made, but it's this type of transparent reasoning that helps us to understand God's thoughts and the thought of others, of Lucifer as well. So it's this group reasoning where we, where maybe our assumptions and our processes become transparent. And there was something really central about it being a choice, and, and, and it can't be a real choice unless there's, there are options, right? Mm -hmm. um, Somebody else have something you want to add to that? Or please, in fact. Well, um, I think that Heavenly Father is always trying to get us to um, figure things out for ourselves. So I, as a kid, I used to always think the Grand Council was like one event, but we don't really know if it was just one event or not. And maybe Heavenly Father really did know what was going to be the best option, but he's always doing that in, in our lives, helping us to figure out what we help us to like get to the right answer through a long process. I've got another, build on that for just a minute, think about it. We've got, uh, there were three different state conferences. The, the subject that was assigned by the general authorities to the state presidents was to talk about ward councils. Why? I mean, there's really a relatively few number of people who participate in the ward council at any particular time. Why is put that kind of emphasis there? Please. Because there are principles inherent in the counseling process that are of... It's our job. There are principles inherent to the counseling process that are extremely valuable for couples, for families, for people who are just dating and trying to figure out relationships, principles of charity and listening and openness and uh, trying to seek the Lord's will together that are extremely important. I, I think you're right. And in fact, if you think about what are those principles, you, you mentioned a few. Somebody else want to add some? I know that they were very specific to make sure that you, we, we know that all those who participate in the council are to be participants in the council, right? Don't find ways to just say, oh no, you're just a representative of your organization. You are in fact there to add counsel, and in fact the very process of receiving revelation will come through this counseling process. That's been the message, right? I think that's really a powerful thought. It suggests some really interesting things about what educators ought to be thinking about, I think. Don't you think? Like what? Please. I've been thinking lately about DNC 121, <coughs> um, about how intrinsic persuasion is to, to the powers of heaven. And when you're talking about a council, then you're talking about that education is about inculcating what we probably don't know yet about how Persuasion is an eternal principle, not just just a temporary. And, and persuasion is the right word for it because it's a, it's distinguished very uh, specifically from coercion, right? <coughs> or from uh, unrighteous dominion. That's an 
But this was then becomes a really interesting challenge for us to think through as educators. What is our role if we're going to set out by the end of this hour, all of you are going to do the following, and not one child is going to be left behind? Right? I mean, that, that, there's a, something catchy about that phrase, but it reminds me of a different phrase that uh, um, Behold, here am I, send me, I will be thy son, I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it, wherefore give me thine honor. Why was this satanic? <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm making parallels, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not actually a parallel because it came from Satan, so therefore it's... <laughs> this, this one came from Satan, so I... Um, what, what makes it sat satanic, other than he said it? <laughs> I'm drawn back to um, President Boylan's talk yesterday about uh, the joy we feel when we do things together um, and uh, Lucifer's loneliness and singularness and insisting that, uh, that it would be him and him receiving the, the glory. And so um, I think counteracting that with what we know of, of our personal responsibilities that each person took on in something like this grand council to do to take part in the plan of salvation that it was a um, a collective effort <coughs> collaborative where we said I would like to help um, and Lucifer was saying he could do it all on his own without uh, following the plan I mean, that I have. When God says this is my work and my glory it means my glory is partly dependent upon your choices, mm -hmm. right? That's an interesting problem, especially for educators. Please. I have a favorite quote from President Hinckley. Can I share it? Sure. He says, I think it ties into a lot of these comments, he said, effective teaching is the very essence of leadership in the church. Eternal life will come only as men and women are taught with such effectiveness that they change and discipline their lives. They cannot be coerced into righteousness, like we're talking about. Or into heaven. They must be led, and that means teaching. This idea of persuasion, teaching, no coercion, implications for educators. <coughs> Seems like it ought to be. Yeah. Where if we lose that? I, I, you know, I, get to, I mean, it, it, it comes down, wherefore, because Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord, have given him. How do, you, how do you destroy or seek to destroy the agency of man? <coughs> I think agency is uh, tied up with responsibility, and anytime we try to take away responsibility as well as choices, and uh, not worry about what people care about or what they like or what they think about things and just push them through, they're no longer agents. They're just cogs. Sounds kind of like that to me. The king said, yeah, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men and lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. There's an interesting... Wait a second. Okay, these are... This is basic kind of beginning doctrines, and, and I think that to ponder those more carefully and consider where that takes us. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and, and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil, for he seeketh that all men be miserable like unto himself. Something about this seems like we need to be really sensitive to it. You know, I, I graduated from instructional science. Um, that's what it was called then. Um, 1982. Um, I'm not sure they want to claim me as the philosopher side of it. But, uh, uh, it uh, I was haunted by that scripture in the library that said, and as all have not faith, seek ye out of the best books. Uh, seek learning even by study and also by faith. I had a pretty good idea of what it means to seek learning by study. I used to call it soaking at the end of the semester. I'd sit in front of my textbook and, and I'd pretend my brain was a big sponge and soak it up. 
in the categories of A, B, C, D, and none of the above, and I, I walked carefully to the top <laughs> so it didn't spill too soon. And then I squeeze it out into those bubbles and uh, this total mental enema and I was ready for a new semester. <laughs> but I, when you look at the, the issue, what does it mean to seek learning also by faith? What does that mean to you? Because that sounds like the preferred way, doesn't it? In that scripture. What does it mean to seek learning also by faith? Please, come back. I know when I know when I've learned, um, I find starting with prayer and almost kind of like counseling with the Lord in my learning um, is really useful because there's times when places where I probably wouldn't spend time, I have the thought to spend more time, and the opposite as well. Um, and I feel like when I do that things tend to stick, and they tend to be the things that I end up needing, um, and I can sometimes even, I've had times where I'm studying for a test, I know that's on the side, but I've had times where I've, you know, frantically been trying to learn all the information I can and just had the thought, don't even worry about this section. Okay, I'll go on that on faith, and sure enough, I didn't need to worry about that section, or I knew enough that it was all right. And so for me, I feel like um, studying by faith, or learning by faith, is almost putting trust in God that he will help you to learn everything that you need. There's clearly a spiritual component that's being an invitation there. And I'm not sure that you can't study with that spiritual component as well. But faith is a wonderful term. You know, are you familiar with the lectures on faith? That uh, were taught in the School of the Prophets? Uh, they're really wonderful invitation. Of what is it necessary to have the faith unto salvation? One of the phrases that really caught my mind is that faith is the uh, motivating power in all action. Um, that's an interesting thought. And on one hand, it's like, well, okay, so um, how do I do that? I, mean, I really don't know how I do that. I mean, you could, you could give me a, a class on the neurological uh, you know, impulses that the brain sends to this muscle that contracts and, and uh, say, yeah, well, yeah, that's great, but how do I do that? I don't know. But I do know that there's something that is powerful about this concept of faith in terms of it being a principle of action. Now, what you put your faith in, of course, is really the, the, the key to most of that. But there's a side of this that starts to say, okay, well, you know, here's one distinction I think you can make between study and faith. Study tends to be, I'm looking at what other people think. Right? And what they've studied, and what they've experienced, and I try to learn from that. The other one is to say, and what do I learn by my own actions, and participation, and my prayers, and my insights, and the kinds of experiences that I have, and uh, it seems to me that there, that ties in quite powerfully with that scripture, doesn't it? It would suggest if, in fact, we're to learn also by faith, that it has something to do with what we're doing. Um, let me uh, take a little... What do I got here? Ah, here's a, another phrase that just almost... It's, it really haunts me. As well might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River as to do what? Uh, as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. So why don't we know more? Got our umbrellas <laughs> turned the wrong way. I, I, yeah, we got our umbrellas <laughs> turned the wrong way. That's an interesting fact. I think there, it would have to come down to there must be something about the heads of the Latter-day Saints. Don't you think? Not for us enough. <laughs> I, I know maybe that we're not following things like how many times does it tell you in the scriptures to ask and you shall receive? And somehow we think, oh no, no. I mean, remember Laman and Lemuel's answer when to, uh, they came to uh, the Nephi came and said, oh, you're so smart. You know, what have you been doing? Well, we're, we're arguing. We can't figure out what our father means by the, the uh, olive trees and his dream. Like, well, have you inquired of the Lord? 
And their reply was, no, we have possible. not. Uh, the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. I can almost imagine the rest of the conversation. You think, I mean, you've got to use your brain for something. You don't, even, you don't just, and you know, Nephi just come back from being taken up to a high mountain, seeing what it all meant, and to, um, says, okay, well, what's your question? Well, it meant this, and what meant that? So they could get some answers through Nephi's experience. But Nephi's experience was way cool. I don't know that he shared that with us because he's the only one that could have it. I don't know very many people that are praying for the rest of the Book of Mormon. <coughs> um, probably because we feel guilty, we don't know the Mormon God very well. But those other kinds of promises that say, you know, when, 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 when you begin to exercise the faith of the brother of Jared, you'll be able to see the things that the brother of Jared saw. That's a, that's a promise from the Book of Mormon. And we kind of think, well, oh yeah, but I've got to take my class and we got these things to do on Thursday and, you know, uh, I don't have time to worry about that. I, I, I know that the way that work, works its way out in practice. Um, and I guess it troubles me a little bit. The Prophet Joseph made this wonderful statement. If men do not comprehend the character of God, they do not comprehend themselves. I want to lift your minds into a more lofty sphere. I teach people correct principles and they govern themselves. Now, let me do you, I'll give you a, a crash course and see if I do this in 10 minutes. Um, of uh, the theories of education, according to Richards. They tend to be under one of two extremes or somewhere in between them. One of them says, man is a ball of clay. What can you tell me about a ball of clay? Malleable. It's malleable. Um, what should this ball of clay become? Up it's up to who? Should we ask the ball of clay? A little ball. I know there's some sculptors who do this, and I always thought they were weird. <laughs> a little ball of clay, what do you want to become? And they're young. How do you motivate a ball of clay? You've all had classes in doing this, by the way. You just tilt the table a little bit. <laughs> Hold it next to you, the fire. You learn the techniques of shaping and molding. Right? You push here, you pitch that, you push this. There's different kinds of clay, but... No, you don't have to. It's, it's up to the, the, the sculptor to decide what this little ball of clay will become. Um, John Locke put it this way. If you can once get into the children a love of credit and apprehension of shame and disgrace, you can have them put into them the true principle which will constantly work and will find their mind to the right. A great secret of education. You've got this tabula rasa, blank slate, and all you got to do is learn the techniques for credit, love of credit, and... and hate shame, and, uh, and you can learn to control them and steer them as you do um, anything else, right? Well, on the other extreme, you get Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and uh, um, they turn towards nature. Say, no, 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 it's terrible to think of man as a ball collect. Man is a seed. If I've got an acorn here, what can you tell me about it? It has great potential. And uh, to what? Yeah, Anything? It's, whatever it's going to be. Kind of oak tree. Uh, if it's an acorn, it could be what? An oak. An acorn tree. An oak, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do you motivate a seed? Okay, little seed. Let's start. Let's start. I'll give you another spurt of water. Right? Yeah, we don't do that. What do you do with the seed? You place it in a rich environment, and guess what it does, <clears throat> if it's a good seed? It grows. Does that sound like an educational theory? Not that we use very often anymore, but uh, it would be a different way to approach it. Uh, Rousseau's words, uh, God makes all things good, man meddles with them, and they become evil. Man is born free, and everywhere he's in chains. It's time for us to have an education that, that celebrates what is the tree? Allow the natural development. And, and you know, all of the cognitivists and the thing. So you got this big battle between the kind of behavioristic side and the cognitive side. But I'll, I'll suggest a, another dimension to it. You got the one, ex, one extreme, the ball of uh, clay, the other, the seed. How do we create an environment where they'll just grow naturally? Um, and that, that would give us a bunch of theories. You can put almost any of them up here. I want to add another dimension. Um, most of our theories today presume that God is irrelevant. 
Right? I mean, you look at your theory books. Tell me what role God has in instruction. It's almost assumed he has none. That's, not, that's probably not accidental. And when you start to add it in, people get really nervous and uncomfortable and say, how dare you? Uh, this is offensive. Um, or you're pushing the ideas on me. But I like like the distinction. If you look historically at our education like this, there are those that are secular. Meaning, they just presume that God is irrelevant in practice. There are those that believe there is a God, and he ought to make a difference. Then we've got four quadrants in which theories of education could develop. Um, one puts the emphasis, um, like a ball of play, and as a secular part of it, it turns the teachers typically into the kings in their classroom. Um, secular authorities to shape and mold these little bodies to become useful somethings in, in society, products of society, right? And we even speak of them as products. Something about that, does that strike you as the way we ought to think about that? Maybe. Um, we do a lot of thinking that way. There's a lot of focus that uh, would say, yeah, our job is to make efficient social role players, and we need to do that to, as effectively as we can. Um, <coughs> The individualist model would be to say, no, no, let's look at the seed. We plant the seed in this rich environment, and it grows, and lets it uh, become. If you come on this other side and say, well, what if you think there's a God involved in this thing? Then you get the uh, what I'm going to call the theological model, which historically was the most um, well, frequently um, defended position, I think. Um, and then I'm going to ask this suggestion, well, what about this other side that would say, we believe that there's a God, but it's not necessarily, uh, it's much more like a seed than, than we think. But, uh, you know, I'm, you can tell you which way I'm, I'm going to persuade you already. Well, let's look at those. Societal models say the society is most important, and so they appoint uh, and certify teachers, and the teachers then shape and mold these students to become something useful in society according to whatever standard and specifications that the factory, uh, the school, or the society has uh, set out for them. Um, now we're looking at lots of balls of play, but basically to say this is what we want you to be and your job is to make sure that they all have those specifications. I could say this probably nicer, but I'm not going to. Um, and then of course the, uh, the sculptor learns the techniques to shape and mold and they become certified uh, to do that and send them out to market. This sets up the king to the subjects. I have, in fact, it's really fun the first uh, first day of the classes to say, okay, for this uh, first two weeks, address me as your royal highness. And it's just so embarrassing because it fits so well to the kinds of questions that people ask the first day of classes, right? <laughs> oh, your royal highness, would you like this? How long would you like it to be? And would you like it to this? And <laughs> would this please you? Or, you know, later on, you know, oh, your Royal Highness, I, I, was, I, I wrote my paper, but I got hit by a train as I was coming to campus, and I've been crawling for three days, and, and uh, would you please, please accept it a little bit late? And what can I say? Oh, <clears throat> kiss my ring. <laughs> or 14 laps around the McKay building. And then we have to decide whether it's really fair to the others who got theirs in on time. That's the relationship that we set for education. And you know I'm exaggerating. <laughs> Give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed in my own specified world, to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to make, take any one of them at random and train them to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, yes, even beggar man, anything. That was the, the ideal of John Watson and his behavior of them. Thorndike puts it, whatever exists, exists in some amount to measure it, to simply to know that it's varying amounts. The work of teaching is to produce and prevent changes in human beings to preserve and increase the desirable qualities of body, intellect, and character, and get rid of the undesirable. To thus control human nature, the teacher needs to know it. That's the ideal, right? Or Skinner's words. What we need is a technology behavior. It is the environment which acts upon the perceiving person, not the perceiving person who acts upon the environment. I did not direct my life. I didn't design it. 
I never made decisions. Things always came up and made them for me. That's what life is. It's kind of depressing. <laughs> but it, it, it has something to do with that, that grand council, I think. So what about the individualist model? Then you've got people saying, well, the student is most important. If your students have to drive everything, right? And it's the teacher that just kind of facilitates the environment to make it so that this, the learning will take place. You plant the seed in the ground, you don't put it on a freeway and expect it to grow, you put it in some rich soil, and then you nurture it. Uh, teachers typically are pretty good at fertilizing. The ultimate end of education is a preparation for independent action. It is not the gardener who opens the roots of the tree, that they may draw in sustenance from the, sustenance from the soil. So the educator, he only sees to it that no external force should hinder or disturb the natural course of development of any capacity. We have no right to withhold from anyone the opportunities for developing all their faculties. Very different concept of education, right? Or in Montessori's words, the new education has as its primary aim the discovery and freeing of the child. The greatest sign of success for a teacher is to be able to say the children are now working as if I, th I did not exist. A.S. Neal's version. A child is left is innately wise and realistic. If left to himself without adult su suggestion of any kind, he will develop as far as he's capable of developing. The battle is not between the believers in theology and the non-believers in theology. It is between the believers in human freedom and the believers in the suppression of human freedom. Well, you've got some pretty extreme cases. If you know what their, their schools were like, I'm not sure I'd send my kids in to those, but uh, you can see where it's coming from. On this side, we won't spend very much time with it. I don't know that many of you will be tempted by that, but you should know the tradition that it came from. Uh, you have at the top, uh, of course, the church or God, and they make them fairly synonymous. Um, your job is to uh, prepare the teachers, the teachers then shape and mold those students to become good church members. Now you might be tempted to use this at home for the Summer Institute program. You might be tempted to think of it this way. But I don't know that most of you will be tempted by that in any other settings, uh, certainly not in public schools. But it became, then it, the shifts the relationship uh, is not the king to the subjects, it's the priest to the parishioner. Where the position is more like, I have not only the responsibility to teach you um, what I think is important for you to know, I, it is what God wants you to know, and I'm his representative, so you obey me. In one form or another. Uh, John Calvin put these lovely words. Um, he, meaning Adam, having been defiled by sin, the pollution extends to all his seed. Thus from a corrupt root, corrupt branches proceeding, transmit their corruption to the saplings which spring from them. The children being vitiated in their parent conveyed the taint to the grandchildren. In other words, corruption commencing in Adam is by perpetual descent conveyed from these proceeding to those coming after. You're not just balls of clay, you are corrupt clumps of flesh that have to be molded and shaped to be maybe, if you're plucked out uh, by God's grace, uh, to be something that he would make of you that you don't deserve. Um, some of them weren't quite so extreme. I think LaSalle, for example, he loved his students. I really know he loved them. But listen to the way he talked about it. Teachers will plan the questions, the sub-questions, the answer to the sub-questions. They will render an account to God and will be guilty in God's sight for the ignorance of the children who have been under their care. Students will be seated, their bodies erect, their faces and eyes turned toward the teacher, their arms crossed, their feet on the floor. The teacher will indicate with a signal the first who is to be questioned. Before answering those questions, will rise, take off their hats and their gloves if they're wearing them. You can imagine those old cathedrals they were in. <clears throat> Remove their gloves if they were wearing them and cross their arms. Students will answer the question in such a way that in, by including the question, the answer will make complete sense. Then we'll have righteous souls, souls right? Or uh, Luther's position. I would advise no one to send his child where the Holy Scriptures are not supreme. Every institution that does not unceasingly pursue the study of God's word becomes corrupt. The universities only ought to turn out men who are experts in the Holy Scriptures, men who stand in the front line against heretics, the devil, and all the world. 
But where do you find that? I greatly fear that the universities, unless they teach the Holy Scriptures diligently and impress them on the young students, are wide gates to hell. <laughs> I'm sure you'd have an opinion about what we're doing. Well, so what about the agency approach? For me, there's an interesting arrangement. I become, and say, what's most important with me? If I look at those selectors on faith, it tells me that I, in order to have faith and the salvation, there are three things. You know what they are? You have to know that God exists. You have to know something about his correct attributes and uh, correct understanding of his attributes and characteristics. And then the third one's the kicker. What's that one? Please. An assurance that you're, what you are currently doing is exactly what you You need to know that the course that you are pursuing is according to God's will. How are you going to know that? He has to tell you. you it's not enough to say, well, I got my Franklin planner up, I checked off all the boxes. Maybe they don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm way outdated on that. <laughs> um, but it is a matter of saying, whatever else you're doing, you need to square it with him. And he's told you that he would do it. I am a child of God. He sent me here. I get to sing that. And I get to be his teacher. If I'm the teacher in this one, I have to know that that relationship is the most important one. And as a student, what do you get to do? You got to do the same thing. Right? Really, what are we? I mean, say what I will. I mean, I got a PhD. You know, it's working on it now. But I am your brother. Nothing more, nothing less. And that is a significant relationship if I took it seriously. And, and so it then becomes, well, what do we do in this relationship that would say, um, when we get together, and you're trying to figure out what your mission is, and I'm trying to figure out what my mission is, what can we do so that that is moved forward? It's, it happens. I know it happens. But it's so weird the way that it does. You know, if you were to try to make the general conference instructionally sound, you'd have to do all kinds of weird things for it, wouldn't you? You'd send out these pre-advanced uh, things, look for these kinds of issues, and then make sure you have the test afterwards so everyone gets the same content. 